Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Angela Hernandez. This story starts off in July of 2018 when a woman named Angela was driving down Highway 1 near Big Sur on her way to Southern California. While driving, a small animal ran out into the middle of the road and of course for a multitude of reasons, Angela didn't want to hit it, so she swerved. Unfortunately, this led to Angela shooting right off the edge of the cliff in her SUV, which then led to a tumble down about 200 feet to a grim area of the rocky beach. I call it a grim area because it's a place where no one visits. Of course, this entire scenario is exceptionally traumatic and severe, and it left Angela with very serious injuries. After the crash, she was suffering from a brain hemorrhage, fractured ribs, a broken collarbone, ruptured blood vessels in both of her eyes, and a collapsed lung. But despite all of these injuries, the most important thing was that she didn't die, and that she wasn't about to let her fate be sealed right there. She was initially unconscious after the crash, but when she came to, she saw water lapping over her knees. She had a multi-tool in her car that she was able to use to break out the window so she could crawl out, where she then swam to the beach and passed out again. Later, when she woke up, she realized she had no shoes and the severity of her injuries started to set in, but despite all of this, she got up and started walking. She used a hose from her car to help collect water from the dripping moss along the shore, and every time a car passed by, she tried to get their attention, but unfortunately because of where she was, no one could see her or hear her. Seven days after the crash, some hikers were out and about searching the beach for fishing spots when they came across the wreck of the Jeep. Thankfully, these people didn't stop there and continued searching for the person who belonged to the Jeep. That is when they found Angela sleeping on some rocks. They gave her water and called for help, and finally, after seven days, she was able to be rescued from this absolute nightmare situation. In our number nine spot today, we have Marco Lavoie. Marco is a person from Quebec who was headed up to the northern area of the province for a canoe trip. During this trip on the Nottaway River, he had set up camp, of course, as one does, but unfortunately, nature had some other plans for him. A bear ended up coming and raiding his camp, and while doing so, ate all of his food and destroyed his boat, which left Marco with very few supplies and his dog. Marco survived out in the wilderness for an unbelievable 90 days before he was rescued and when he was found, he was completely out of it and was delirious and was barely saying any words at all, and he wasn't with his dog anymore. After a bit of time in the hospital while healing from his injuries, he finally revealed the desperate measures he had to go to in order to survive, and that involved using his companion as food. Of course, this came under immediate scrutiny, and he received a lot of hate for the decision he made. Of course, however, we can all be upset about what happened and acknowledge how tragic the situation was, but none of us can really judge unless we've been in the same sort of dire situation. After the entire situation, survival experts began to come to the defense of Marco, saying that you have to do what you can to survive, and after a certain time, the decisions sometimes aren't even conscious ones, and it's simply just survival instincts kicking in. In our number eight spot today, we have the Miracle of the Andes. I talked about this one on another video recently because this is perhaps one of the most famous survival stories of all time, and it starts in October of 1972 when members of the Old Christians rugby team, along with members of their families and their friends, were flying to a match in Chile. The pilot made a mistake and began to descend while in the Andes, and this led to the plane striking a mountain, which sheared both of its wings off, and the plane then crashed into a remote area that has been nicknamed to the Valley of Tears. The initial crash took the lives of 12 people, which left 33 survivors. A search party was initiated, but after eight days, it was called off because the conditions on the mountains were considered near unsurvivable and because the remnants of the white aircraft would be basically invisible in the snow. In order to survive, the remaining people who were stuck here had to resort to the most extreme survival methods in order to sustain themselves, which involved using those who had passed away for sustenance. In the coming weeks, six more people passed, and then an avalanche took the lives of eight more as if they hadn't already gone through enough. It is now December, remember this flight happened in October, and two of the remaining survivors set out to find help and miraculously found three Chilean men four days later. By December 23rd, all 16 of the remaining survivors were rescued after being stranded for over two months with no food, no gear, literally nothing. If going through all of that wasn't enough, the public tried to criticize how these people went about surviving this absolutely horrifying situation, but they rightfully defended themselves 
themselves and their actions. In our number seven spot today, we have Aaron Ralston. This is another one of those stories that has gone down in history as one of the most famous survival stories ever because it's truly unbelievable, but also thanks to the blockbuster movie that was made about the entire ordeal, which then brought the story to people who hadn't yet heard of it. In April of 2003, 27-year-old Aaron Ralston was climbing in Utah's Blue John Canyon when he found himself in an unfortunate situation where an 800-pound boulder fell on him. This caused his right hand to be crushed, which then left him trapped. Of course, Aaron tried everything he could to free himself, which included using his multi-tool he had on him to try and chip away at the rock, as well as trying to fashion some kind of a pulley with his climbing rope in an attempt to pull the rock away from him. After multiple failed attempts and a total of six days being stranded, Aaron realized that his only way out would likely be to amputate his own crushed hand. When describing what that was like, Aaron told National Geographic News that it was, quote, a hundred times worse than any pain I've felt before. Yeah, Aaron, I truly cannot even imagine. Thankfully, this was enough to free Aaron and he was able to get the medical attention he needed and of course survived. Aaron even ended up going back to climbing after his recovery with help thanks to a special kind of prosthetic hand that has a built-in climbing pick. While we're on the topic, just a quick shout out to all those engineers and medical professionals who dedicate their lives to building prosthetic limbs for people. It's such a cool and important job and I don't feel like we recognize them enough. So thanks. In our number six spot today, we have Ernest Shackleton. Ernest is a man who braved the harsh conditions in the South Pole once, so by 1914, he was ready to do it again. He set out with a group of 28 men and they all had the intention to make it all the way across the continent to then arrive at a ship that would be waiting for them on the other side. Well, things took a bad turn almost immediately as they were on their journey to the Antarctic when they all became trapped in ice as their ship, the Endurance, fell apart. From here, they were trapped, their supplies slowly began to dwindle and this led to the men getting aboard life rafts to then float for 14 days through the icy Antarctic seas to an island. Unfortunately, once here, this wasn't the end as the men then had to take another long journey all the way to the nearest inhabited island, which was South Georgia Island, and this took them about a thousand miles from their original point. Imagine having to float for a thousand miles hoping you make it to where you want to go. Despite everything the men went through on this journey, all 28 of them survived the entire ordeal, but sadly the same could not be said for some of their furry companions. Unfortunately, the men found themselves in situations similar to Marco that we discussed earlier. To make matters even worse, the ship that was waiting for the men on the other side of the Antarctic, the one that of course never ended up actually seeing the men at all, the Ross Sea Party ended up experiencing three deaths. In our number five spot today, we have Steve Callahan. Steve Callahan was a man who had just finished his successful solo journey across the Atlantic, and this insane story starts out when he was on his way back. Steve was sailing in his six and a half meter sloop in January of 1981 when a storm struck, but this didn't concern Steve as much as the hole that was left in his boat's hull from either a whale or a shark, as that was most definitely taking over his attention. The boat began to sink, and this is when Steve was quick thinking and repeatedly dove back into the sinking ship to grab as much survival gear as possible. Steve was now left on a six foot circular raft adrift in the Atlantic. At this point, he was about 800 miles west of the Canary Islands, but as time went on, he was only drifting further and further away. While lost at sea, Steve fished with a spear gun and made drinkable water using a solar still. On day 14 of being adrift, he signaled to a passing ship, but it didn't stop for him. After a month of being at sea, he was far out from the shipping lanes, and by day 50, he was really struggling to live. He was covered in sores from the salt water, he was extremely dehydrated, and there was now a hole in his raft that was getting difficult to keep patched. After 76 days had passed, Steve was exhausted and he was so thin he had lost a third of his body weight. Birds began circling his raft to try and scavenge the leftover fish guts that Steve had tossed back into the waters, and while that is really gross, this is actually what led to his rescue. The swirling birds led to some fishermen spotting Steve on his raft, and then they came to the rescue. Steve had lasted over two months lost at sea and managed to keep himself alive the whole time. In our number four spot today, we have Joe Simpson. Two best buddies, Joe Simpson and Simon Yates, were doing their thing, climbing throughout the Peruvian Andes when a terrible accident occurred that left Joe with a broken leg and heel. This is obviously a really big issue when climbing mountains, and it's also important to note that the 
climb the men were doing was a particularly difficult one, and throughout their experience there were some very severe weather conditions that they were also facing. Simon tried to help Joe and tried to help them both get back to safety, and to do this they tied their two ropes together to then lower Joe down the different mountain stages, all the while doing this in weather that was continually worsening. Simon lowered Joe 3,000 feet using this method, and they felt for a while like things were going to be okay, but just as they were getting relatively close to the safety of the glacier, Joe went over an unseen cliff edge while being lowered, which meant that Joe was hanging completely free with only the rope that Simon was holding keeping him from falling. Literally his life was in Simon's hands at this moment. Joe couldn't get his weight off of the rope and there was no way that Simon could possibly lower him any further. The two were stuck here for what was later estimated to be over an hour and a half and the longer they stayed here the more Simon was being pulled by Joe from his unbelayed stance. Simon was 150 feet above Joe and who knows how far above the glacier they were aiming for. There was unfortunately only one thing they could do in order to keep Simon from falling off the side of the mountain, and that was to cut the rope. In doing so, Joe fell about 50 feet to the entrance of a crevasse, where he then fell again to a ledge within the crevasse. After cutting the rope, Simon dug himself a snow hole in the slope behind his stance, which he then spent the night in. The following day, he completed his descent to the glacier, and since he wasn't able to find Joe, he just assumed his friend had lost his life, and he returned all the way to base camp. Little did he know, however, that Joe did not lose his life, and instead he was able to climb and crawl out of the crevasse, and after four days, he himself reached the base camp. Both of the men survived, and of course people criticized Simon for cutting the rope in the first place, but Joe understood the situation for what it was and quickly came to his defense, saying that had the roles been reversed, he would have done the same thing. There really was no other option in this scenario, and in the end, thankfully, it all worked out. In our number three spot today, we have Julianne Kopka. Miss Julianne has like a two for one when it comes to survival stories. Her story starts out on Christmas Eve 1971 when she was just a teenager and was on Lanza Flight 508. The plane was struck by lightning, which is an actual nightmare situation, and this led to the plane starting to basically disintegrate midair. If you've seen any horror movie that takes place at high altitudes where the plane gets broken, you know what happens next. In what felt like the blink of an eye for Julianne, she found herself still strapped to her seat just two miles above the Peruvian rainforest. She was injured, of course, full of bruises, had a broken collarbone, but she was alive. And in fact, she was the only person who had been on the flight that was still alive. But now she was in the wilderness alone and all she had with her was a bit of candy for food. Julianne found a small stream which she began to wade in downstream. The insects in the jungle were eating her alive and sorry this is so gross, but maggots had infected her arm. Julianne ended up coming across a sort of encampment where she found a few supplies. She was so smart and was able to give herself a little bit of first aid, which included pouring gasoline on the infected arm, which then led to all the disgusting little creatures leaving it. Just a few hours later, a few lumber workers found her, gave her more first aid treatment, and took her to an area that was more populated, where she was then airlifted for medical treatment. In 2000, her story was told through the documentary titled Wings of Hope, which was directed by Werner Herzog, who took particular interest in the story because it is obviously incredible, but he too had booked a seat on that flight and he would have been on it if it wasn't for a last minute change of plans. In our number two spot today, we have Ada Blackjack. Ada was a woman from Alaska and she was a part of the indigenous Inupiat people. She was hired by some Canadians for an expedition to the Wrangell Islands, which in current times is Russian territory, but back when this story took place in 1921, the expedition was intended to claim the islands in the name of Canada. Ada was hired to be the cook and the seamstress for the expedition and was told that she would be one of many indigenous peoples on the trip, but this was a lie. There were five people left on the island, including Ada, and the other four people were European Canadians and Americans. They first got to the island on September 16th, 1921, but quite quickly they realized their rations were running low. Three of the crew members left Ada alone with the other member of the crew who was ill, while the three went off in search of resources, and this was the last time any of them were seen. Ada was left to care for this ailing member who was sure to treat her horribly while she essentially kept him alive. Soon the ill member passed away and Ada was now completely alone. Ada survived alone on this island for two years after they initially arrived. Two years! 
This is unbelievable for many reasons, including the imminent risk of a polar bear attack at any point. She ended up being rescued after all this time alone, and she used the little bit of money she had from selling furs that she collected over the two years to get the help needed to cure her son's tuberculosis. Ada was undoubtedly an incredible person with an unbelievable story, but it's also very important to note that not only did Ada receive criticism for not keeping that one crewmate alive, but she also spent the rest of her life in poverty, despite the multiple books that were written about her and the entire ordeal. I think that really speaks for itself. In our number one spot today, we have the Apollo 13 crew. Many of us have heard of this story before because it is truly unbelievable, but also because of the Tom Hanks classic. And no, I am not talking about Toy Story 2. This space crew took flight on April 11th, 1970, and had the intention of landing on the moon, but because of an oxygen tank explosion on board that nearly killed them all, these astronauts were forced to go the furthest out in space any living human has ever been in order to save their lives. They used the lunar module as a lifeboat, and they stretched their rations that were intended to be a day and a half worth of food for two people into food that lasted for four days among three people. They faced hardships some of us can't even imagine while those on the ground worked tirelessly to figure out how to get them home safely. Had to make an orbital correction that took them far from the moon and about 248,655 miles from Earth before they could slingshot back around towards Earth. The lunar module was their safe space while still out in space, but re-entry to Earth is a totally different ballgame. This meant they had to get back into the damaged command module for this part before they were able to land back on Earth, and they did so safely. Everyone involved in this entire mission, from the crew in space to those on the ground working to save them, did incredible work, and it really is a story that will never be forgotten. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ann Rogers. This story of 72-year-old Ann from Tucson on Arizona starts out on March 31st of 2016. After taking some wrong turns on a remote dirt road, Anne found herself a little lost, out of fuel, and out of range of cell phones. This led to her family of course reporting her missing. On the first night, Anne made a good decision by staying with her car. She had some extra clothes with her which helped keep her warm, she had some extra water, and some snacks for sustenance. The next day, however, Anne was feeling restless and like she needed to do something, so she left her car. Survival experts usually warn against that, and for a fair reason. If Anne had stayed with her car, she would have been found on April 3rd, which is when police found the abandoned car, but as we know, that didn't happen. Thankfully, however, Anne was still out there, and she was actually doing quite a good job at keeping herself alive. She built fires every night, she drank, quote, pond water to keep her hydrated, and she even found edible plants to consume, and at one point, a turtle, which she roasted and ate one night. Apparently, Anne had taken a class on survival, and she continued to research after the class, as she was particularly interested in desert survival. Talk about a coincidence, right? Apparently, at some point in her journey, Anne became frustrated that authorities hadn't found her yet. She has since said, quote, I was frustrated, but I knew there were people who cared enough to make sure somebody found me. That is definitely true, Anne, but the authorities were also putting in a lot of effort. There were man trackers, scent dogs, and aircrafts all searching for her, and Anne was sure to use her skills to help them out. She made a large sign that read help from sticks and rocks, and this is what was spotted on the ninth day of her having been missing. The pilot who spotted her called for help and has said, quote, I was completely shocked. Up to that point, I thought we were looking for a body. I didn't expect to find her alive. The helicopter was able to swoop in and pick her up, and Anne was treated at a local hospital and released a short while later. Anne was impressively prepared. She stayed calm, and she did a lot of things that helped herself stay alive and be found, which is truly commendable. I think I might suddenly sign up for a survival course, you know, just in case. In our number nine spot today, we have the Donner Reed Party. If you are unfamiliar, the Donner Reed Party was a group of American pioneers who set out to head to California in 1846 in a wagon train. Apparently, there was something that caused some delays for this trip, and instead of waiting for a better time, they set out, which only doomed them in the end. The group ended up becoming stuck for the winter of 1846 to 1847, and they were snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Some of the group couldn't withstand these harsh temperatures and unforgiving environment, and they ended up succumbing to either starvation or sickness or perhaps a combination of the two. Those who were still alive had to resort to consuming those who had already passed away in order to stay alive. The group was snowed in, high in the mountains, and the first of their help didn't arrive until February of 1847, almost four full months after they had become trapped in the first place. Two other rescue parties later came to them to bring them food and try to get at least some of the party out of the mountains. In the end, only 48 of the original 87 members ended 
up living to reach California. This sadly all could have been avoided in a multitude of ways, mostly by waiting until a more appropriate time to take this journey, but it is possible that they didn't know, and it's likely that no one expected this kind of tragedy to occur. In our number 8 spot today we have the Gremlin Special. Okay, there are tribes of people that exist on this earth that we refer to as quote uncontacted. Basically they are communities or groups of indigenous people who live without sustained contact with other communities. Many of them want to be left alone to live their lives the way they choose, which is definitely something that should be respected. Some of these communities are hostile to visitors from the outside, which is pretty understandable, and some have ways of life that are extremely different from ours, which also makes a lot of sense. This is exactly why you can imagine everyone's surprise when a plane crashes right into the middle of an island that has a group of people who have a tradition where they consume the flesh of their enemies. On May 13, 1945, a US Air Force C-47 that had been nicknamed the Gremlin Special ended up crashing in New Guinea. Out of 24 people that it carried, only three of them survived the crash. Lieutenant John McCollum, who surprisingly was relatively unharmed, Women's Army Corps Corporal Margaret Hastings, and Sergeant Kenneth Decker, both of which were quite badly hurt. Well, as it turns out, sometimes rumors and rumblings are not at all what they turn out to be. While these three survivors were undoubtedly terrified to learn that they had crashed on an island full of cannibals, they soon realized that the stories they had heard were far from the actual truth. Oh. What a surprise! In the end, luckily for these three survivors, the group of people they came into contact with were exceptionally kind to them and helped nurse them back to health. In the end, they spent 42 days in the jungle, some of which were certainly more difficult than others, but in the end, they as well as their rescue crew were saved from the island and taken back home where they could continue to recover. In our number 7 spot today we have the fishermen. This story starts off when 5 men left a fishing village in Mexico on October 28, 2005 in the hopes to head out on a several day long fishing expedition. The first of many bumps in the road to occur was when they lost their heavy shark fishing tackle. Then, as they were trying to recover this lost tackle, their boat ran out of fuel. So far, not good. The shore winds pushed them further out to sea and before they knew it they were caught up in the current and being taken 5,000 miles deeper into the open ocean. While this was happening the boat's owner known as Juan David as well as one of the fishermen on board called El Farcero passed away from starvation and the other members buried them at sea. On August 9th, 2006 a Taiwanese fishing trawler spotted the boat and ended up rescuing the rest of the men. If you notice the date I started with and what date we're now at on their rescue you'll realize that yep, they last did 9 months and 9 days lost at sea. This is one of the longest on record in terms of sea survival and the 3 survivors apparently did this by turning towards what they knew best. Fishing. This kept them fed on their journey along with the catching and eating of raw seabirds, which one of the members was apparently so good at catching, it earned him the nickname the cat. They still had some knives and other small equipment with them and they used what they had to make hooks from engine parts and lines from cables, they learned to live off of this raw diet, they drank fish blood when there wasn't enough rainwater, and they passed the time by singing, dancing, pretending to play guitar, and praying. The worst of the times were in December and January when they were faced with harsh storms. They were unable to fish and there was a serious and very real threat that their boat might sink. The longest the men went without food was 13 days when the three of them only had one seabird to share the entire time. In the end, as we know, they were rescued and taken back to their home where they were hailed as heroes. In our number 6 spot today we have the Lykov family. In 1936 a Russian family of 4 was fleeing religious persecution and to do so they fled into the Siberian wilderness. They took with them a few possessions and some seeds and retreated into the forest. Here they would build a series of primitive huts as they traveled through until they finally reached a spot they found habitable, which was near the Mongolian border. They had no contact with the outside world and managed to become completely self-sufficient. When they originally fled into the wilderness, the family consisted of a husband and wife and their two children, and while out here in their new home, the couple had two more children, making them a family of six. They spent their days hunting, trapping, and farming, and each year they saved their seeds in order to replant when the next season came around. One of the possessions they brought with them was a crude spinning wheel which allowed them to turn hemp into fiber for their clothing. They ate a lot of potato pads that were mixed with hemp seeds and ground rye, and they lived like this for almost 50 years. They grew as much food as the land would allow and they rationed carefully, but each year they grew closer and closer to starvation. As they grew closer to starving, they held a council meeting where they discussed whether or not they should save their seeds to replant or eat them all. Each year they ultimately decided to save their seeds, and one winter this cost the mother her life, which she sacrificed for her children. Until a geology team in 1978 found their home, the two youngest children had never even met a person outside of their family. 
family. While most of the family has since passed away, one member, the youngest daughter, as of 2019 still lives in this isolated location where she has built herself quite a decent hut and has a herd of goats and a coop of chickens. I'm not sure if this story is about devotion or if it shows how teamwork is essential or how people's faith can really keep them going or how survival instincts are the ultimate tool. Maybe it's just all of that wrapped up into one. In our number 5 spot today we have Madeline Connolly. Madeline was a Chicago woman who was out in Montana visiting an uncle of hers. While on this little trip she set out with her dog for a nice little hike during the daytime and while she wasn't familiar with the trail it was marked so she felt like all should be well. Since it was a nice day when she left and she planned to be back before dark, she didn't bring a jacket with her or any food. By the time nightfall came and she wasn't home, she realized that she had gone far off the trail and wasn't even close to being home. Maddie said that she hiked quite late into the night but ultimately decided to lay down, snuggle up with her dog so that they could both keep warm and get some rest before the next day. The following day, Maddie and her dog hiked the entire day but still ended up having to spend the night sleeping outside as they were still lost and rescue didn't seem like it was coming. Maddie and her furry companion drank creek water and ate glacier lilies for seven days while they tried to stay alive and find a way out. After seven days of hiking, Maddie, on many occasions, felt like all hope was lost, but in an amazing and startling turn of events, Maddie and her pup ended up running into the party that was out searching for them. The pair were rescued and taken back home. They received the medical treatment they needed, and in the end, they made it out alright. In our number four spot today, we have Jan Balsrud. Jan was a young instrument maker during the era of World War II, and he was asked to help the anti resistance in Norway during the war. This led to him being on a boat that was traveling through the icy Norwegian waters, which is where the beginning of this story really takes place. While on board the ship, German soldiers began to shower the boat with bullets, which took the lives of everyone on board except for Jan. He managed to dive into the freezing waters with only one boot and sock on, and minus one big toe that had just been shot off. While being pursued by at least 50 of these German soldiers, he swam to the Norwegian coast where two girls who were on the beach helped him. There were several other Norwegian citizens who then came to secretly help him reach safety in Sweden, but it wasn't an easy route. At one point he was traveling through the mountains while also trying to protect himself from an ambush style attack, and while doing so he found himself caught up in an avalanche that caused him to fall 300 feet and left him snow blind and severely concussed. He then aimlessly wandered in the snow for days, suffering from hallucinations. He was then found by some kind person who helped nurse him back to health. Once healthy again, he then made another push to try and get to Sweden, but again was held back by German soldiers. He had to hide out in ice holes where he then had to cut off the rest of his toes to save his feet, and at one point he even attempted to take his own life because things were just so bad. In the end, this thankfully didn't work, and he was able to make it all the way safely to Sweden. This story definitely shows his bravery, his quick decision making and skills, but it also shows how everyone needs a little help along the way sometimes. In our number 3 spot today we have Vesna Volovic. On January 26th, 1972, Vesna was a 22 year old flight attendant, and she was signed to JAT Yugoslav Airlines Flight 36. 67 from Stockholm to Belgrade with a stopover in Copenhagen. Apparently, the company which she worked for had actually mistaken her for another employee who shared the same name, but since she had never been to Denmark before, she just saw it as an opportunity to travel and went on the flight anyway. Less than an hour on the journey from Copenhagen to Belgrade, the flight exploded midair. The plane fell from its height of 33,000 feet and landed in a village in what today is the Czech Republic. A member of the village, Bruno Honk, went to inspect the crash site, of course not expecting to find any survivors but he found one. Vesna. He pulled her from the wreckage and used his knowledge that he had as a World War II medic to keep her alive until rescue came. Among the 28 people on board the plane that day, Vesna was the only survivor. She suffered three broken vertebrae, two broken legs, broken ribs, and a fractured skull, and once she arrived in the hospital, she was in a coma for several days. When she awoke, she had no memory of the accident at all. Doctors didn't think she would ever be able to walk again, but after just 10 months, she was able to. Apparently, she credits this to her quote, Serbian stubbornness. Vesna's story is still one of the most incredible survival stories and it landed her this strange Guinness World Record of Longest Fall Without a Parachute, which I don't think is a title she is too keen on holding. There are a number of reasons why people believe she escaped her certain death. Some believe her position in the rear of the airplane with the food cart prevented her from being sucked into the air when the plane broke apart. The plane's impact was also softened by the trees in the snow, but I think, hey, the woman survived a plane crash. Whatever the reasons or whatever led to that, it's all incredible and we should just focus on that.
that. Vesna has been quoted as saying, quote, everyone thinks I am lucky, but they're mistaken. If I were lucky, I would never have had this accident. In our number two spot today, we have Tammy Ashcraft. If you've seen the movie Adrift, which stars Shailene Woodley, then you might be familiar with this story. In September of 1983, Tammy and her fiance Richard Sharp set out on a 4,000 mile journey across the Pacific Ocean in order to help a friend deliver a 44 foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. This was much longer than the pair had ever sailed before, but they felt due to their experience and having each other, they would be able to do it. So I mentioned they set sail in September, and by October, a category 4 hurricane blew them way, way, way off course. The pair tried to ride out the storm that was kicking up 40 foot waves and 140 mile per hour winds, you know, hurricane stuff. And when Richard told Tammy to head below deck, right after, she heard him scream, and before she could help, she was thrown against a cabin wall and knocked unconscious. When she awoke the next day, she found the yacht mostly destroyed, and Richard was nowhere to be found. She found his safety harness dangling over the end of the boat, which caused her to realize that he had been thrown overboard. The cabin was filling with water, the masts were broken, the sails were dragging in the sea, and both the navigational system and engine were in not very good condition. Despite her injuries and her loss, Tammy kicked into survival mode. She used a broken pole and a storm jib to create a makeshift sail, and she began pumping water out of the cabin. She found a sextant and a watch, which helped her navigate towards the closest landmass, which was the 1,500 mile away island of Hilo, Hawaii. In total, she spent 41 days adrift at sea and survived by eating canned fruit salads and sardines. In the end, she was saved by a Japanese research ship that had noticed the drifting yacht near the coast of the island. For six years after the accident, because of her head injury, she was unable to read, but when she was more recovered, she penned a book about the whole ordeal. Since she has spoken about the entire thing, saying, quote, definitely the hardest part was dealing with Richard being gone. There were times I didn't even want to live anymore because I didn't know how I was going to go on. I was never going to fall in love again. But she also added that, quote, but actually, while I was in the survival mode, the grief was fairly low. It wasn't as intense as when I got to shore and the survival was over, and I could see people together and everything kept reminding me of him. I just really had a hard time. But the survival instinct while at sea just kicked in. It helped me to focus, to keep myself on track. Tammy's story is definitely a reminder of just how strong our instincts can be. In our number one spot today, we have Beck Weathers. In the spring of 1996, American pathologist Beck Weathers headed out on an expedition to summit Mount Everest as a part of an eight-member crew that was led by veteran mountaineer Rob Hall. As the group got further and further up the mountain, Beck began to realize that due to an eye surgery he had previously had, he wasn't able to see very well in the harsh climate, and once it got dark out, his visibility was frighteningly low. Because of these vision troubles, when the group got near to the summit, Rob, the leader, told Beck to stay on the side of the trail while he took the rest of the group to the top, and he assured them that they would come back to get him on their way back down. Beck didn't really want to do this, but he agreed. He waited and waited and saw other groups pass him on their way down, and some others even offered to take him, but he stayed and waited for Rob. Unfortunately, Rob would never come back. Once the group had reached the summit, one of the climbers was too weak to continue on, and Rob refused to leave his side. One of the group members who did descend ended up passing Beck, which is how he got this information, and Beck decided to wait for another member of the team who was on their way down, Mike Groom, because he was Rob's fellow team leader. Once Beck was with Mike and the other climbers, they began making their way down, but of course there was a blizzard brewing. The storm left Beck and the other climbers quite disoriented, and they couldn't find Camp 4 which was the camp that was closest to the summit. When the storm broke, Beck and four other climbers were so weak that they were left alone so that those who were stronger could go off in search of help. Another guide from another group came to rescue several of the climbers, but at this point, Beck wasn't there anymore. This is because he had previously lost one of his gloves and he began to really feel the effects of the high altitudes and absolutely freezing temperatures, which led to a sort of delirium. He apparently jumped to his feet, yelled out, I've got this all figured out, and then was subsequently thrown from his feet, toppling over the other climbers by gale force winds. The other climbers were sure he had died, but he didn't. Instead, he was spending the night in a bivouac in a blizzard with his hands and face exposed to the elements. When he woke up, he figured that he had been left for dead, and he started to think, if I don't get up right now, then this is all going to be over very quickly. His sheer willpower managed to get him up, and he hiked all the way back down to Camp 4 on his own. His fellow climbers were shocked to see him, and they still didn't believe he was going to live, so they thought they might as well just make him comfortable. In a tent alone, Beck made it through another freezing night in utter agony, thanks to his friend frozen hands and face, and the next day the other climbers were again shocked to see him still alive and coherent. Finally, they helped him walk on his frozen feet down to a camp lower down, where one of the highest altitude medical evacuations performed by a helicopter was done. In the end, four of the people on Beck's original group passed away, but Beck escaped with his life. Following the rescue, he had his right arm amputated halfway between the elbow and wrist, all four fingers and his thumb on his left hand were amputated, as well as parts of both of his feet. His nose was amputated and reconstructed with tissue from his his ear and forehead. Following the entire
entire ordeal, Beck has said that the experience was worth it because he gave him a renewed sense of purpose. He said, quote, I gave up some body parts, but I got back my marriage. I got back my relationship with my kids. I've got a new grandbaby. All in all, if I had to do it again, every pain, every misery, every bit of suffering that comes from it, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Hugh Glass. I'm not gonna lie. When I first saw this name pop up as I was doing research for this video, I thought it was one of those prank names, but turns out it 100% is not, and I just suck. Anyway, Hugh Glass was an American fur trapper, trader, and hunter, as well as an explorer, which, given the time frame of his life, 1783 to 1833, we can all imagine exactly what that would have looked like if you catch my drift. If you've seen The Man in the Wilderness or The Revenant, you'll be kind of familiar with this story. So basically, Hugh and some other men were out on a fur trading adventure, and at some point in the journey, they regrouped at Fort Kiowa before setting out to Yellowstone River, but as they were searching for animals to hunt, Hugh accidentally stumbled upon and subsequently disturbed a grizzly bear who was with her two cubs, which we all know is a bad scenario. The bear charged at him, bit him, slashed him up, you know, exactly what you think happens when someone is being mauled by a bear. Despite this attack, Hugh, with the help of the other men, was able to fend off this bear, but he was left with some serious injuries. The group carried him for a while, but they realized that doing this was slowing them down, and at this point, they were convinced that he was going to die from his injuries. This is when the leader asked for two volunteers to stay behind with him until he passed away and then to bury him, which two people stepped up to do. Then, because of what the two volunteers would later claim to be a sort of ambush attack, the two men grabbed Hugh's rifle and knife and basically all of his equipment and ran out of there and went to catch up with the rest of the group, where they then falsely told them that Hugh had died. He was able to regain consciousness, but now he found himself abandoned, and he had festering wounds, a broken leg, and deep cuts on his back that exposed his bare ribs. He set the bones in his leg, he allowed the maggots in his wound to continue eating the dead flesh so as to try and prevent gangrene, which is disgusting, and then he began crawling the 200-some mile journey back to Fort Kiowa. He crawled toward the Cheyenne River where he made himself a sort of float device, and then he floated downstream towards the fort. Not only did he survive a bear attack, but then he survived after being abandoned for six weeks, and he actually made it back alive. In our number nine spot today, we have Mauro Prosperi. Mauro Prosperi is an Italian police officer who got lost in the Sahara Desert in 1994 while doing the Marathon of the Sands in Morocco. This marathon is a six-day-long endurance race in one of the most dry and barren places in the entire world. During the race, a sandstorm hit and caused Moro to become disoriented, and he lost his way. One day after going missing, he found an abandoned Muslim shrine in Algeria, and he used it as shelter from the sun. He killed and ate bats to survive, and for hydration, he had to drink his own urine, he licked dew off of the rocks, and he sucked moisture out of the wet wipes he had with him. After failing to be seen and rescued by two different aircrafts that flew right over him, he figured he would never be found, and he tried to take his own life. The heat in the desert, however, is so dry that the wounds clotted, and he thankfully survived this attempt. For nine days, he walked through the desert and ate insects and reptiles. Finally, he found a small group of nomadic people, and they took him to the nearest village. From there, he was flown to the hospital, where doctors said his liver had almost completely failed. Having traveled 180 miles in total, Ross Perry lost 35 pounds in body weight, and it took years for him to fully recover. But despite all of this, he has remained an enthusiastic runner and even returned and completed the same race a few times. In our number eight spot today, we have Peter Skylberg. In February of 2012, two snowmobilers made quite the discovery when they saw a car that was trapped in the snow. They began to dig this car out, and that is when they realized that this car had a man in the back seat and he was alive. It isn't quite clear how or why, but 44-year-old Peter somehow got his car trapped underneath all of this snow, and this is where he spent two months before the snowmobilers were able to rescue him. Two months in a trapped car. Peter told doctors that he survived without food by just eating snow and staying inside of his warm clothes and sleeping bag. The temperatures around the time of him being found were as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, which had people wondering how he didn't freeze, and this is thanks to what people referred to as the igloo effect. The snowed-in car is probably exactly what shielded him from the elements, just enough to ensure that he didn't freeze. No one is quite sure exactly how he survived, but 
but some suspect he may have gone into a sort of hibernation. Either way, because of the snow and his adequate water intake, two months is definitely getting close to as long as a person can go without food, so thankfully he was found when he was. In our number seven spot today, we have Michael Benson. In 1992, as Michael Benson and Chris Duddy were in a helicopter over an active volcano in Hawaii, shooting some aerial footage for a movie, the helicopter crashed. It is said that the helicopter lost power so suddenly that they didn't even have time to radio for help. This led to the two men and the pilot, Craig Hosking, being stuck inside of the volcano, just missing a bubbling pool of lava. The pilot and Chris were able to get out of the volcano not too long after the crash, but the same couldn't be said for Michael. The volcano emits a ton of noxious gases, but luckily where the men ended up was in a part of the crater that enough fresh air could also reach. Michael didn't know that the other two men were already out of the volcano, and he was extremely worried that they had perished, all the while of course being worried about his own fate. He tried to pass the time and calm himself down by reciting the alphabet backwards, he prayed, when it rained he cupped his hands to collect the drinking water, but none of this could distract him from these sudden small eruptions and bubbling lava below. After two days with no food or sleep had passed, Michael thought he was at his end, but rescue helicopter pilot Tom Hauptman was able to see Michael through a small momentary break in the steam before the fog all took over again. They knew where he was, but they had to go in to save him with no visibility. Almost two hours after being spotted, Michael was able to make it into the safety net where he was then lifted out of the volcano. He recalls a triumphant feeling as he left. In our number six spot today, we have Matthew Allen. Okay, when I was a kid, every time I was mad at my parents or brothers, I thought about getting a stick, tying a little handkerchief around it filled with my most precious belongings and running away forever to live a life in the wild jungles of Saskatchewan. I thought about doing that, but never did because I would quickly be reminded of how I would absolutely not be able to even get down the block before turning right back around. Unfortunately, however, the same could not be said for Matthew Allen. In December of 2012, the teenager at the time, like most of us during our teenage years at some point, got tired of his parents' rules and restrictions on his life and decided to run away from home. But aside from how just running away is a terrible idea in general, the timing was also just all wrong. He ran away during a record-breaking heat wave and after running away, the 18-year-old went missing for nine weeks. By the time he was found by some hikers, he was lost in the Australian outback, disoriented, unable to stand, and he had lost half of his body weight. He was surviving solely on creek water. He was extremely lucky to have survived for as long as he did, and he really just made it. Thank goodness for whatever led those hikers there that day, because he was cutting it extremely close. In our number five spot today, we have Jose Salvador Alvarenga. On December 17th, 2012, Jose set out on a professional fishing trip with a young fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. They planned the trip to take around 30 hours and they were setting out to hunt tuna, mahi-mahi, and sharks. Just a few short hours into their trip, however, things went awry when a storm struck that lasted five days and it of course blew them way off course. Jose of course radioed in to his boss to call for help, but unfortunately the radio had been totally disabled by the storm as well as the rest of the boat's electronics and the motor was also badly damaged. When the men didn't return, a search party was sent out, but it only lasted two days before being called off because they just assumed the men had already passed away. The two men survived by eating raw fish, turtles, and jellyfish, and they drank rainwater and turtle blood, but the weeks quickly turned to months and there was still no sign of rescue. This is when the young fisherman fell ill from the raw food diet and he sadly passed away. Jose was now on his own and he managed to survive another nine months alone at sea until he finally spotted a small island. He abandoned the boat and swam all the way to shore. He had reached the Marshall Islands and he met a local couple who immediately alerted the authorities. He survived out there for 438 days and it is estimated that he covered somewhere between 5,500 to 6,700 miles. In our number four spot today we have Douglas Mawson. Douglas was another person who was called an explorer and he was also a geologist. He is most well known perhaps for his face being on the paper $100 note in Australia but part of the reason he landed that gig is due to this story. In December of 1912 12, Douglas, along with two other explorers, set off on an expedition meant to explore the interior of the Antarctic, but unfortunately, only pure tragedy ensued. First, one of the explorers, Belgrave Ninnis, fell into a crevasse along with most of the group's best dogs and a ton of their supplies. The other two now had to push on without most of their food and equipment in the unforgiving environment that they were in. The two fell ill with things like scurvy and they were struggling to get back to their camp, and they ended up surviving for a while by eating the dogs that remained with them, and then they just barely scraped by on the rest 
rest of their food portioned out with starvation rations. The other explorer, Xavier Mertz, ended up passing away from exhaustion, starvation, and people also assumed the possibility of toxicity from consuming the dog's liver. In the end, Doug battled the elements for about 30 days before he finally made it back to camp in February of 1913. But when he got there, he realized that he was frostbitten, skeletal, exhausted, and that he had also missed the ship that was retrieving the rest of the crew by just hours. To add a little more drama to this one, there are rumors that he may have kind of sabotaged Mertz's starvation rations that would have, quote, hastened his death so that he could consume his final companion, but that is all rumors and it has never been substantiated, so we'll just assume that that is untrue. In our number three spot today, we have Truman Duncan. In June of 2006, Truman, who was a switchman, headed in to work for another day of working on the trains. During the workday, he ended up accidentally falling and landing in between moving railroad freight cars. This ended up leaving Truman trapped under the wheels, which not only cut off his legs, but also sliced through his pelvis bone. He somehow, absolutely miraculously, stayed alive, stayed conscious, and was able to pull out his phone and call 911. Some speculate that perhaps the weight of the car is what prevented him from bleeding out, but regardless of whatever it was, it truly is incredible. He ended up losing his legs, his pelvis, and a kidney, but the most important thing is that he didn't lose his life. No one is really exactly sure how he survived, but it definitely has had to do something with Truman's ability to stay calm and call for help, even in a situation I couldn't even imagine being faced with. In our number two spot today, we have Mary Vincent. Mary Vincent's story starts out in September of 1978, when she was hitchhiking to her grandpa's house in California. She was on the side of the road with a group of other hitchhikers, which is exactly why it was weird when a blue van pulled up and the man inside claimed he could only take Mary with him. Huge red flag right there, which Mary definitely picked up on, but this being the 70s, coupled with her young age, and the fact that she just wanted to get to her destination is what caused her to still accept the ride. As the drive went on, Mary ended up falling asleep, and when she awoke, she quickly realized the nightmare she was in, as she realized they were now in Nevada, not California. She began to panic, but the man driving assured her it was just an honest mistake. Yeah, I pick up random strangers all the time without knowing where I'm going and somehow end up in another state. Yeah, no worries, Mr. Weirdo. The next time they stopped, the man ended up attacking Mary. He then threw her out of the car and proceeded to cut her arms off with a hatchet. At this point, she was now unconscious, and he put her body, assuming she was going to or already had passed away, into a concrete pipe and down an embankment. After he left, Mary regained consciousness and realized that she could not just give up and stay there because no one would find her. She got up and climbed up to the road, all the while holding her arms up in order to slow the bleeding. She was able to flag down a car and was rushed to the hospital. She not only survived, but testified against the man in court. Mary continues to live a happy, fulfilled life after surviving what many people would call the impossible. In our number one spot today, we have Alison Botha. Sometimes I hear a story that I truly cannot believe is real, and Mary's was definitely one of those, and Alison's story is also absolutely one of them. She is a woman unlike any other, and this survival story starts out in her home in South Africa in December of 1994. She was 27 years old at the time, and after a night out with friends, she drove back to her apartment, and when she parked her car, a man with a knife ended up forcing his way inside. The man forced her over into the other seat, and he began to drive her car with her inside to go and pick up some sort of accomplice. These two absolute monsters, who really don't even deserve to be named, took Allison to a deserted area on the outskirts of town, and did some of the most violent and disgusting things I've ever heard that I absolutely cannot repeat here on YouTube, and then they just simply left her for dead. At this moment, Allison was still breathing, despite having been disemboweled, and I'm not even making this up, despite being nearly decapitated, and not only was she still alive after these injuries, but she also said, quote, I realized my life was too valuable to let go of, and that gave me the courage to survive. This is when Allison not only wrote the names she knew her attackers by in the dirt, with I love mom below, just in case she didn't survive, but she also saw headlights in the distance, and she knew that this was her chance. She started to pull herself up, and this is when she realized how injured she really was. I kid you not, Allison held her intestines in with one of her hands and used her other hand to hold hold her head onto her body, and she made her way towards the headlights. Thankfully, a young veterinary student named Tian Ellard was on the road that night, and he saw Allison and stopped to help her. He used his vet knowledge to help keep her alive until emergency services arrived, and the doctor at the hospital where Allison was taken said, in reference to her injuries, that they were the most severe he's ever seen. Not only did Allison survive, but she also remembered so much about her attackers that she was able to lead them right to the police. The two are spending the rest of their lives 
lives in prison, while Allison uses her voice and her experience to empower and motivate others around the world. Allison is truly a remarkable human being that I am absolutely in awe of.